All right, second example of a, um, an argument. In this argument, um, we're going to have to use predicate logic. Let's read it and see why. It says here, Sean is a student in this class. Sean drives a Ferrari, and then everyone who drives a Ferrari has a speeding ticket. All right, right there, the, the inclusion of the word everyone, so we've stepped away from talking about Sean or any particular person to just everyone, right? That is a for all. Uh, quantifier right there. So that already we're you know we're, we're talking about uh, we're talking about a quantifier with with predicates, and then therefore some student in this class has a speeding ticket. So um, some student there is a there exists quantifier. Okay. So um, I think if you read this, it's pretty convincing, right? Because clearly, if Sean is a student in this class and he drives a Ferrari, and everyone who drives a Ferrari has a speeding ticket, well then Sean must have a speeding ticket and therefore someone in this class has a speeding ticket because that's, that's Sean, right? Um, so you can, you can make, you can, you know, uh, uh, you can reason through it yourself and, and, and be convinced, but let's work through the actual symbolic proof. Okay, so we're gonna do this all with predicates and quantifiers um, and we're gonna be working in the domain of people. Okay, so our domain is people. So first, Sean is a student in this class. Oh, I forgot, I, we should go over these. Um, these are the predicates we're gonna be using for this one. We have C of X, X is a student in this class, F of X, X drives a Ferrari, and T of X, X has a speeding ticket. So uh, premise one, Sean is a student in this class. That would be just C of Sean, right? Sean is an element of the domain, so we can make Sean a possible value of X and write C of Sean. There we go. Sean is a student in this class. Now two, Sean drives a Ferrari, so that would just be F of Sean. All right, F of Sean. Now three, we're gonna have to use a quantifier. Everyone who drives a Ferrari has a speeding ticket. So everyone is a for all, so for all X, for all people. What? Now it says, who drives a Ferrari? Uh, Back in in, in 1.4, I didn't. I don't think I explicitly pointed this out, but you may have noticed that if you want to limit what you are claiming to just a subset of the domain, what you can do is use an implication statement. In this situation, we're going to write uh, for all people X if they drive a Ferrari, if f of X then they must have a speeding ticket, then T of X. So what that does is, it, is it's essentially saying, essentially limits, limits it to everyone who drives a Ferrari, right? So for all X, if they drive a Ferrari. Um, if you have people who don't drive a Ferrari, then this implication is vacuously true and it still satisfies, you know, it's still being satisfied. But if you have someone who does drive a Ferrari, this implication is only true if they also have a ticket. Right, because true implies true is the only way to make to get a to get a true out of an implication um, with a true hypothesis. So that's how uh, you can represent that statement. Now the conclusion, therefore, some student in this class has a speeding ticket. So this is going to be there exists x. Now in this case, we don't want to do the implication. We don't want to say if they are a student in this class because um, then you could satisfy existence with a person who's not in the class and that's, that's, that would be vacuous. Instead, we just want to say there exists a person, X, who is in this class, so, so C of X, and they have a speeding ticket, so and uh, T of X. Okay, let me pause and See how I'm doing? Yes, I think I did, so it's all good. All right, so there's how we uh, represent our argument. Okay, so now to, be, to prove uh, proof validity, we're gonna start by assuming uh, one, two, and three, right, assume our premises. And now um, we're gonna look for things to conclude. So here's where we're gonna need to use, uh, we're gonna need to use uh, rules of inference that we already talked about, but we're also gonna need to use these ones down here. These are special rules of inference that specifically apply to um, apply to uh, situations where you're using quantifiers and predicates. These are basically ways of kind of translating back and forth between the two levels of logic that we're working with. You, I want you to imagine this is, um, uh, here let me draw a little picture. Uh, I want you to imagine this is basically, uh, we have a lower level 
of logic, which is propositional logic. And then we have sort of a higher, more sophisticated level of logic, which is our um, predicate logic. And these rules of inference here, these ones on the bottom, these are used to sort of, sort of migrate or navigate back and forth between these levels. So let me show you what I mean. Um, if you have uh, this, this first one, universal instantiation, says if you have for all x, p of x, kind of like we do in this argument, in the third premise we have for all x something, right? If you have for all x some proposition p of x, then you can write p of c for any c that you want in the domain. Okay, so that's essentially saying you can apply that predicate p to any element of the domain you want, and it's going to be true, right? Because it's, this is claiming that it's true for all. Um, so that takes you from the predicate level, where you have a quantified predicate with a variable, down to the propositional level, where you just have a predicate with a, with a constant inside of it. This is a proposition. This is a proposition too, but it's quantified, right? Um, so it's kind of bringing it down one level, and then you can work on that P of C using rules that apply in propositional logic. Now the universal generalization is the opposite of that. If you have P of C for an arbitrary C, right? So if you have, if you know P of C for some element of the domain which is arbitrary, this word is extremely important. Arbitrary means that it could be any element, right? It's not, the truth of P of C is not dependent on the particular C value, it's just, it's an arbitrary one. Then you can generalize it and say it must be true for all. So this is going from predicate level, sorry, from proposition level back up to predicate level. And then the other, the other two, the existential instantiation brings you down and the existential generalization takes you back up. So um, that's uh, how you can think about those. I'm gonna show you how to use them. In this case, the first thing we wanna do uh, is um, take our pre pre uh, premise number three and we want to uh, instantiate it. We're going to use the universal instantiation. We're gonna instantiate it with the instance of uh, Sean. Right, Sean is going to be the particular element we apply it to. So we can write f, taking, taking from here, we can write f of Sean implies t of Sean. That is a um, universal instantiation of number three. All right. So we're saying for all people, if they, if they drive a Ferrari, then they have a speeding ticket. Now we're saying Sean drives a Ferrari, therefore Sean must have a speeding ticket. So now five. Um, we do know Sean drives a Ferrari, right? So that's the that's the hypothesis. We can use modus ponens now, so we can conclude this this T of Sean here. That is modus ponens of uh, premise two and statement number four here. All right. Now we've got T of Sean. Um, well, what we're aiming for is this, right? We're we're trying to get here. There exists x, c of x, and t of x. Well, we have t of Sean, and we also have c of Sean. So why don't we put these together? If we know this and we know this, we know their conjunction. So number six, we know c of Sean and t of Sean. That is just a conjunction of number one and five. Conjunction. Conjunction is one of our rules of inference here. Conjunction. If you know P and you know Q, then you can write P and Q. All right. Note that um, we can only use this. We, you can only use conjunction. I mean, in general, you can only use these ones up here if what you're dealing with are propositions. Okay. So um, you have to. We have. To, we it, we needed to do this instantiation and 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 you know and conclude T of Sean. We needed to do that um, before we could apply the rules of inference. I mean, we needed to do that before we could apply modus ponens even, all right? The instantiation has to happen first before you can apply any of these rules up here. All right, so now we have C of Sean and T of Sean. Now we're ready to, to, to go back um, from the proposition level back up. You know, now we're doing this way. We're gonna go back up to the predicate level. We wanna generalize and say, therefore there exists an X, C of X and T of X. That is our uh, existential generalization rule here. We know P of C for some C, and we're going to conclude there exists X P of X. 
So in this case, we're going to write uh, from this, we're concluding there exists x, c of x, and t of x by existential generalization of number 6. And that is our conclusion, which completes the proof.